So welcome everyone to the Friday seminar. Today we're very uh, happy to have uh, Anastasia Fialkov with us. Um, she uh, did her PhD in uh, Tel Aviv University with professors uh, Itzhaki and Barkana. Then she held postdoctoral fellowships at uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure and Harvard. And since 2019, she's lecturer at Cambridge University. And uh, today she's gonna talk about the first billion years. So Anastasia, thank you very much for being here and you have the floor. Thank you very much for this invitation. And uh, um, I prefer that if you have questions, please interrupt me and uh, I'll start. So, uh, okay, now it doesn't switch. So to give, to set up a stage, uh, um, I'd like to start with overviewing the existing observations and how they sit together in the big picture of the observable universe. Of course, we have uh, measurements of cosmic microwave background and uh, they were wonderful providing information on the early stages uh, of the universe, uh, the baby picture, how it looked when it uh, was just uh, 400,000 uh, years after the Big Bang. And we know that um, from the CMB that it started with tiny fluctuations uh, due to inflation that uh, gradually grew to give rise to first dark matter structures that were able to accumulate gas and form stars. And later this developed into massive galaxies that we see today. Uh, our uh, large scale structure surveys on the other uh, end probe this evolved galaxies and uh, cosmic web and they even push to uh, frontiers such as uh, epoch of ionization. For example, the most distant galaxy observed to date sits at redshift of 11, which is very far into ionization when the universe was mostly neutral. Uh, and uh, one of the most distant quasars is a stretch of 7.5. So it's a very, uh, it's a supermassive black hole uh, existing already at that early epoch. But when we uh, come to really scanning the structure formation, then we only cover big chunks of the space out to reach of three. So between cosmic microwave background and the sledge scale surveys, uh, there is a big portion of the universe that we have never observed. Uh, it's a very intriguing part of the universe because that's where the very first stars and black holes formed. Uh, and uh, we have only vague, uh, picture of it by extrapolating or interpolating between the CMB and the existing observations of galaxies uh, and quasars and large scale structure today. So 21 centimeter signal that I will be talking about today is an actually a very powerful tool uh, that could allow us to probe all these intermediate epochs and uh, try to uh, and allow us to constrain the formation of first stars, black holes, and uh, hopefully also teach us about the nature of dark matter. So 21 centimeter signal um, is uh, produced by hydrogen atoms in the, in the neutral intergalactic medium. And uh, so neutral means that we need to go deep into the universe before the epoch of ionization. Uh, and after the epoch of recombination when CMB was produced, uh, and it would be a signal uh, emitted from hydrogen atoms populating the neutral intergalactic medium between star forming regions. So this epoch is very different from what we observe today. And uh, the first dark matter halos that could form stars were very small. Uh, so about 10 to the 5, 10 to the 7 solar mass halos, which is much smaller compared to uh, 10 to the 12, 13, 14 uh, solar uh, the yeah, solar mass halos that we have today. So these are tiny and the mode of star formation uh, there is also very different from what we are used today because gas out of which stars formed was pristine. It wasn't enriched by supernovae yet and was mainly composed of hydrogen and helium. So people think that first stars were relatively massive compared to today. A fragmentation could have worked differently in this uh, primordial uh, gas clouds. Uh, and uh, this star formation regimes are very unconstrained. 
so so uh, uh, black holes that formed the uh, cosmic dawn and supernovae could have been different uh, and therefore we this all will result in the codes for 21 centimeters that have to be very flexible and cover for these uncertainties. But with it comes a, 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 an opportunity to explore this completely new regime and to find out how the stars and black holes formed. So existing observations actually indicate that star formation could have started very early, despite the trainization is relatively late. So we know from observations of high redshift quasars, slime and alpha emitter, CMB, the trainization uh, should have completed by redshift around six, starting roughly around redshift maybe 10 or 12. Uh, but indirect evidence suggests that uh, it could have, the star formation could have started very early. For example, Almas is a very metal-rich galaxy at redshift nine. Uh, and if you extrapolate this uh, star formation to, to find out when star formation actually should have started in this galaxy, uh, it's roughly at about redshift of 15. Also, as I mentioned already, Hubble Space Telescope through gravitational lensing does see very luminous galaxies already at redshift 11. Uh, and they'll be talking about 21 centimeter signal today. So we had the first ever detection, which is still unconfirmed, uh, shown here on the bottom right. But if it is confirmed, that then it is a direct evidence of star formation at Retro already 20. So uh, it's a very intriguing uh, time to be doing the research on cosmic dawn and um, Let's see what we can learn from it. So 21 centimeter signal that I have already mentioned uh, is produced by hydrogen atoms and it's uh, a forbidden transition that uh, has a rate of 10 to the minus 15 per second. So it's really rare, but amazingly the volume of the universe is so vast that uh, we can collect observable signals. Uh, and this uh, uh, signals are produced when uh, uh, hydrogen atom undergoes a spin flip transition, so the lowest energy level is actually split in two due to the interactions between spins of proton and electron. Uh, and when, for some reason, atom undergoes this transition, a photon with a wavelength of 21 centimeter is produced. It is a radio frequency of 1.4 gigahertz. And of course, this radiation redshifts to larger wavelengths as uh, the universe expands. So if we observe a signal from redshift 10 uh, or 9, it would redshift to 2 meter wavelengths. So most of the intergalactic medium, because we are talking about primordial universe, was filled with hydrogen, 74% uh, by mass uh, in this uh, uh, regions between stuff from between ionized bubbles, basically. Uh, and this field is uh, very young. It's uh, early days compared to say CMB science. So even models are unestablished. There is a lot of variety. And also we just have the first round of data coming in as we speak basically. And we have very rough first uh, observational constraints on some of the models. So it's a very exciting area. The edges detection that I have already mentioned uh, is uh, an absorption signal uh, by neutral hydrogen, if it's true, uh, from uh, epochs between redshift uh, 20 and roughly 16. So what the, uh, I will explain uh, in the later in the talk how the signal is created. But uh, if it's true, it's actually the first ever signature of stars uh, created at cosmic dawn at redshift about 20. And then it also implies that there is a rich population of uh, X-ray sources, such as first X-ray binaries, that heat up the gas already at redshift 16 to the temperature of the cosmic microwave background. So if this signal will be confirmed, uh, then we already just from this uh, simple observation can learn a lot about uh, the cosmic dawn star formation. Uh, I should uh, here on top right is the snapshot of the telescope. So it uh, seems very simple, 
uh, just a tabletop antenna with a mesh to prevent uh, reflections from the ground in the antenna. But it's actually, it required many years of uh, refinement, uh, work in the basement to uh, calibrate this instrument, and then several years of data analysis to produce uh, this, uh, this uh, line, this signal. So it's uh, just seemingly simple, but it requires a lot of work. And the signal was uh, very surprising and still is, and it, uh, you know, created a lot of excitement and uh, uh, in the community because it uh, is much deeper than what is expected in standard astrophysical scenarios. Here on bottom uh, left, I show in gray a variety of possible signals when we assume lambda CDM cosmology and vary the mode of star formation, black hole formation. Uh, and the assumptions about the normal uh, expected mode of star formation. Uh, and in red is the observed edges signal, and you see that it's uh, almost twice as deep as allowed in this uh, standard astrophysical scenarios. So to explain it, uh, we need to, to explain it in terms of astrophysical processes or so cosmology, we need to invoke exotic mechanisms such as dark matter interaction with gas that would cool gas beyond the adiabatic cooling limit or some form of extra radio background uh, that should can should be very strong, anomalously strong. So it cannot be actually explained by simple radio galaxies extrapolated to higher redshifts. So um, I will talk a little bit about edges, but not so much. So if you have any questions about that, uh, I'm happy to discuss later. Uh, so as I mentioned, that these are early days of 21 centimeter cosmology, but uh, the concept of it is very beautiful. It will give us a tomographic scan uh, once the instrumentation allows it. Tomographic scan of the universe uh, shortly after the combination on all the way through realization. And this is because 21 centimeters is a very thin line. And uh, by observing it at different frequencies, so at different redshifts, we can probe uh, the signal at different redshifts separately. Uh, and it also doesn't suffer from uh, effects such as silk damping that erases small scale fluctuations in the CMB. It is driven by astrophysical scenarios, as I will explain later in the talk. Uh, and it's very information rich. So in principle, uh, for example, with SKA, we can have a tomographic scan of the universe, images even, and uh, see the universe uh, at the entire range of trench. Uh, and SKA will have a, large, a big beam, uh, or wide beam, so we will have a, we will observe a big chunk of the universe. So this is an example of what is called the light cone. So the 21 centimeter signal as it evolves in time from right where I showed dark ages when there were no uh, stars and galaxies yet through the emergence of the very first uh, bright sources in UV and X-rays. And then the sources grow, they change fluctuations in the 21 centimeter signal. And eventually we arrive to the epoch of realization when the signal disappears again. So yellow here is uh, close to zero. Uh, and uh, as you can see, the signal can track the evolution of sources, the change in the nature of the sources, uh, and also the special distribution. So if we observe signal at different cosmic times, we will collect different astrophysical and cosmological information from it. And uh, during dark ages on the right, it's most, oh, sorry, on the left, uh, the signal is mostly driven by cosmology and uh, dark matter. So uh, for example, if dark matter uh, was warm and uh, didn't have small scale fluctuations, we will be able to see it in the 21 centimeter signal. And then cosmic dawn with the appearance of first stars and black holes uh, is sensitive to star formation in very small halos, uh, 10 to the 5, 7 solar masses, formation of this uh, very first black hole binaries uh, that heat up the gas. Uh, and then it uh, would be sensitive to the growth of the structure and the epoch of realization is actually driven by a completely different population as we think today. Uh, meaning a very massive galaxies and quasars that uh, 
are much bigger than those that drive the signal during cosmic dawn. So now I want to dive a bit more in technicality. So don't worry if you lose me and feel free to ask questions. So first of all, during dark ages, as I mentioned, there are no stars. Uh, and the main processes that drive the 21 centimeter signal is actually uh, equilibrium with the CMB. So if we just have CMB around, then uh, all temperatures will come into <laughs> equilibrium with uh, CMB temperature. Uh, and uh, here I define the spin temperature of 21 centimeter signal, which is uh, effective temperature of this transition between hyperfine split levels. So if there is just a CMB, uh, spin temperature will be driven to the temperature of the CMB. But of course, there is not only the CMB, there is also gas and gas collides and has uh, its kinetic temperature. So it's, it's warmer or colder than the CMB. And so these collisions, if they are efficient, they, they will drive spin temperature to the temperature of the gas to the kinetic temperature. So in the simple picture, in the absence of stars, we have a balance between CMB and kinetic gas temperature. Uh, and the C here in this little equation is uh, just a coefficient that depends on the density of the gas uh, and also gas temperature. And it regulates how important the collisions are compared to the CMB. So on this plot, you see the evolution of the gas temperature uh, versus redshift. Uh, and at very early times, uh, shortly after recombination, both gas and CMB temperature are close to each other because there is a residual electron scattering that keeps them together, uh, even after a combination. But then gas actually starts cooling down faster than the CMB just because of uh, thermodynamical uh, laws. Uh, and uh, so it uh, redshifts here about 20 and 10 gas is much colder than the CMB. Uh, and then spin temperature shown with a solid line is coupled to the temperature of the gas at high redshifts. Uh, but then when collisions become inefficient, it goes to the temperature of the CMB. So the 21 centimeter signal, I, and I'll tell you more in a few slides, actually measures the difference between uh, the CMB and gas temperature. Uh, and during this dark ages, it will be seen in absorption against the CMB because gas temperature is cooler than the CMB temperature. Once we add stars, uh, the picture changes because stars emit Lyman alpha radiation and Lyman alpha can couple this uh, hyperfine splitting levels of 21 centimeter signal to the temperature of the gas again uh, via the effect called Wolfshausen field effect. So Lyman alpha photons can be em emitted or absorbed uh, leading to redistribution of the hyperfine population, the level population. So the spin temperature equation becomes more complicated. We need to add this term that depends on Lyman alpha uh, intensity, X alpha. So it just tells us uh, what's the intensity of Lyman alpha flux created by first stars or and by any stars. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, it drives its uh, spin temperature to the gas kinetic temperature again through the coupling to the radiation and line alpha color temperature. So on this temperature diagram, uh, we see that as soon as stars form, uh, here I put them at redshift around uh, 25 maybe, they will couple the spin temperature back to the temperature of the gas leading to a deep absorption a second absorption signal at lower redshifts. And here I assume that gas is uh, cooling down adiabatically, so this gas temperature just keeps dropping. But in reality, there will be X-ray sources that will start heating it up. And uh, at some point, the gas temperature itself will rise above the CMP temperature, and we will start seeing the signal in emission. So it's important to realize that stars, uh, the first stars have a very important effect by coupling the spin temperature to the temperature of the gas and creating this deep absorption uh, as soon as they form basically. So overall we can write the 21 centimeter signal or the uh, difference between the brightness temperature and the CMB. That's what actually we can see. Uh, in terms of astrophysical parameters. Uh, and uh, the main effect, especially during reionization, is how much gas, how much, what is the fraction of 
cosmic gas that is neutral. And this is measured by, by this XHI, the uh, neutral fraction. And that uh, the zero order, it's just, uh, you, you can imagine it as a Swiss cheese model where uh, ionized bubbles uh, cre are created by UV radiation of stars and galaxies, and they will not contribute to 21 centimeter signal because it's just ionized. There is no neutral gas there. While the remaining of the universe is still neutral and will create this signal. Uh, and then uh, in this expression, there is a term uh, that comes out of radiative transfer, basically. And uh, uh, this, in the simplest form, it gives us uh, the contrast between the CMB temperature or the background radiation temperature and the spin temperature. And if this contrast is large, either positive or negative, we will see the signal. Uh, but if it, uh, sorry, uh, if it's, uh, and we will see the effect of uh, gas temperature on the signal. Uh, but it's, if it's close to zero, we will not see the effect of heating and gas temperature on the signal. It will only driven, it will be mainly driven uh, by ionization. So if stars are there coupling the spin temperature to the gas temperature, we will see signal, uh, we will be able to use this 21 centimeter signal basically as cosmic thermometer and measure gas temperature directly and also measure lime alpha flux of uh, the stars. Uh, and then uh, eventually there is uh, this one plus delta term and several dots. And actually these are very important dots because they contain uh, cosmological information. So obviously the signal depends on the growth of structure, uh, amount of collapsed objects, uh, velocities uh, due to line broadening and so on. So it actually, it contains rich cosmological information uh, that, uh, that can be used once we are able to constrain astrophysical processes or we, we need to do a joint kind of analysis of all the effects together. So this is just to recap how we expect the gas temperature to evolve. Uh, again, during uh, dark ages, uh, it's close to the CMB, so the signal is expected to be uh, small, but then it starts to cool down faster than the CMB. And then here, uh, at some point, X-ray sources turn on and they will heat up the gas uh, to the temperature higher, or higher than the CMB. So this will this evolution will be reflected in the 21 centimeter signal. And what actually observers see is uh, they basically observe cosmic micro background black body uh, coming from uh, recombination, but because of the interaction with neutral gas, uh, a 21 centimeter line will either absorb from the uh, CMB black body, creating an, um, a deficit or emit into if the gas is hot or creating this uh, increment. So overall, we will observe spectral distortion of the CMB at the specific frequencies corresponding to the redshift of the 21 centimeter gas clouds. So of course, uh, uh, what I will be showing as a global 21 centimeter signal is subtracting the CMB line out and uh, like flattening the signal versus frequency. So we will be looking at this information uh, contained in the absorption and emission uh, profiles. So of course, uh, there is more information than the just global evolution, average uh, timing of cosmic events, such as star formation and X-ray binary formation, because we can study also distribution of sources around the sky uh, at every ratio separately. Uh, clustering of the sources and also effective horizons of different radiative backgrounds that affect 21 centimeter signal. And there are several of those. I already mentioned lime alpha, uh, ionizing backgrounds, X-ray heating uh, radiation. And also if there are radio galaxies, they will, couple, they will contribute actually to this uh, radio background and deepen the signal uh, at the radii where it's where this radio radiation is significant. So overall, we will see a complicated picture of these bubbles. There are not only ionized bubbles that you're probably all heard about during ionization, but there are also bubbles of hot gas and lime alpha coupled gas 
and radio bubbles. Uh, so, and they all start overlapping when there are many sources, many new sources coming, uh, forming, uh, and, and this picture is, becomes richer and richer. Uh, and every type of this radiation will have their own effective horizons contributing a different radii. Uh, and so by observing fluctuations, by these backgrounds in the 21 centimeter signal, we can actually constrain spectral energy distributions. So spectra of first X-ray population uh, and of radio population. So eventually, again, I showed this picture already, but uh, we will see something compli as complicated as this. And uh, the goal is to, as a theorist, is to build the model and try to interpret this picture in terms of uh, astrophysical effects, actually. Uh, and uh, as of now, at least uh, we um, use a simple, relatively simple parameterization that uh, actually is based on the abundant halo abundance. And then we relate this halo abundance at every redshift to the number of halos that can form stars, uh, where the star formation it's a free parameter at the moment that we want to constrain with data. And also another free parameter is what is the minimum mass of star forming halos because it can be sensitive to different stellar feedback effects and also dark matter cosmology. Uh, and that, then there are parameters that reg regulate X-ray heating. So how efficient X-ray heating is and what is spectral energy distribution of X-ray sources because uh, this can actually be very dependent this is dependent on natalicity uh, of X-ray binaries and how it evolves with redshift. And then there are parameters that regulate ionization. So tau is the CMB optical depth, which can tell us how in average uh, sources were e efficient in producing UV radiation. And uh, mean free path is uh, something that measures the size uh, or the uh, clumpiness of the intergalactic medium uh, at during ionization, so how far red, uh, ionizing radiation can penetrate into the gas. And we also can constrain uh, radio galaxies, uh, so there is another free parameter if we want to do so in the model. So later in the talk, I will show you first constraints on these parameters uh, with some data. They are very weak, but uh, I think it's already exciting. So one uh, statistical statistics that we can explore about the signal is just uh, averaging over sp spatial dimension and uh, tracking the evolution of the uh, globe of the signal in time or in redshift. So this is called global signal, and this is what the edges actually reported. So here on the bottom right is edge signal, and it's exactly this absorption trough contributed by the formation of first stars. And then we need X-rays to go out of this trough. Uh, yeah, and so this global signal contains of in average information about the emergence of the first population of stars, first X-ray binaries, and then significant reionization. And then we, of course, can study even images and do higher order statistics, but the simplest form of that is power spectra. So what uh, I will show is uh, power spectra at co-moving, at fixed co-moving angular scales and evolution of that with redshift. So, so imagine just looking at the same co-moving scale and uh, seeing how power on it changes with redshift. And it depends, so the power will measure uh, clustering of sources on that scale and also spectral distribution of this, uh, of the leading energy, uh, leading, source of fluctuations in 21 centimeter signal. So we will actually see an increase in power when lamina alpha sources uh, become efficient, but then it will decay because it will kind of saturate. And then we will see another increase in power from X-rays. And then finally, when reionization bubbles peak uh, or reionization is roughly half way through, we will see another peak from reionization. In practice, uh, this picture can be blurred because uh, all events can happen at the same time. Here, I, I singled out every effect separately. 
but uh, in practice stars can form and then extra binaries can form very soon after, depending on how quickly this process has happened. And then first stars can be more or less efficient in ionizing gas. So this, peak, this uh, peaks can appear, disappear, merge, and it's just a mess, which we can try to constrain with data. So this is just an example of how 21 centimeter fluctuations would look like uh, for uh, uh, if you vary a uh, stellar feedback process here on the bottom, you see kind of a cartoon uh, of what happens if we uh, first have uh, star formation and mini halos of 10 to the five solar masses, but no stellar feedback. Uh, and then when we add an effect of relative velocity between dark matter and gas. So this effect has to be there and it was overlooked for, uh, and it was only recently noticed. So in this case, you actually would see signature of real relative velocity between dark matter and gas in 21 centimeter signal, because uh, it turns out that dark matter was actually moving so personically fast compared to the gas shortly after recombination. Uh, and in a, Specially dependent manner following baryon acoustic oscillations. And so, regions where these velocities are high, uh, it's much harder for dark matter uh, halo to accumulate gas and form stars. So, they would have suppressed star formation. And we actually see it in the 21 centimeter signal. So, on top uh, left, we see a, a distribution of these velocities in the simulation box with red region being very high velocities and blue regions being uh, small, veloc low velocity field. Uh, and then uh, on this, on its side is a density profile of fluctuations uh, in the initial conditions. And then in the 21 centimeter signal, we actually see a clear signature of these velocities when they're included in the simulation. But the signature disappears if uh, there are other feedbacks me mechanisms that destroy star formation in very small halos. So that's just an example how we can constrain the stellar feedback in this first population of star forming halos. So to uh, simulate these effects and to uh, build a data set that can be constrained with uh, simulation set that can be constrained with data, we obviously need to scan the whole astrophysical uh, parameter ranges, for example, simulating small halos, large halos, and so on, and uh, varying X-ray feedback uh, and X-ray heating and uh, varying ionization prescriptions. So we need some sort of very lightweight simulations that can predict the global signal and also power spectra on large co-moving angular scales, because that's where telescopes will be looking at. Uh, even SKA will not have a great resolution, but will survey large volumes of the sky. So we are fine with poor simulations, but we need a lot of them. And uh, what we are doing is uh, very uh, poor resolution simulations where we use a lot of subgrid physics to take into account the star formation and X-ray uh, heating. So in uh, my specific simulations, I have resolution of three megaparsecs, uh, but then I can simulate volumes of around uh, thousand co-moving megaparsecs, so gigaparsec. Uh, at high redshifts and track the evolution of this with time. Uh, we also need to include the prescriptions for formation of first stars, uh, X-ray, ionization, and radio. Uh, and these are based on uh, numerical simulations that we know and semi-analytical models, uh, but they also are flexible and allow for variation in this uh, uh, prescriptions so that we can directly constrain them with data. Uh, and finally, when these lightweight simulations are not enough because uh, they not light enough because uh, they still require a few hours of running time. Uh, and uh, this is this doesn't allow us to use them in, for example, MCMC chains to, to actually constrain parameters. So when it comes to parameter estimation, we use uh, uh, neural, neural networks and machine learning to be trained on a large set. So for example, I ran 30,000 models 
uh, with proper simulations and then we created a million of uh, results using artificial neural networks and then we constrain them with data this model so actually what you see here uh, real constraints on this astrophysical parameters that i just uh, mentioned here so uh, we see the minimum measures minimum mass of star forming hills of uh, star star formation efficiency effects and sed uh, parameters of x-ray heating uh, sources tau and uh, mean, our mean free path are properties of ionizing sources and the uh, frad is a radi radiative uh, efficiency of radio galaxies. So we can see some constraints on these parameters, even though they're very weak, uh, at most 68%. So it's uh, really weak, but uh, these instruments can already see and rule out some of the models. So this is uh, first constraints and first properties of stars uh, from cosmic dawn and realization. Can, can I ask a question? Uh, sure. So what, what's the data here? Oh, it's, yeah, I should have uh, said it's uh, edges, high band antenna. And this is paper by uh, Raul Monsalve as the first author and me as the second author. So edges uh, has several instruments. Uh, they do see this deep absorption by their uh, low band antenna, which uh, looks at cosmic dawn. But this is uh, a different antenna looking at uh, Ratchet 6 to 15 or 12. So it's really the epoch of ionization constraints. So it's in the absence of a signal that constrains the parameters here. Uh, no, we. Uh, what do you mean absence? Oh yes, uh, it's uh, edges high band doesn't see any signal. So exactly, uh, there is just noise, uh, and any signals at that time that would be above the noise are ruled out. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. So I already mentioned this briefly, but uh, with visualization of how the simulation works. So we have two initial conditions for density and relative velocity between dark man and gas. And then we have subgrid model to input star and black hole formation. Uh, and then this contributes to a bright pixel in the simulation that uh, emits radiation that can be seen by all the other pixels around. And eventually we can convolve it into a picture of uh, many bright sources in different wavelength regimes. And we can sum up uh, on a light console again back in time and summing up all the radiation that can contribute to the radiative background uh, today or at the, at the relevant redshift. So that's how it works. Uh, and let's see what uh, we expect to see in some specific sort of cases of astrophysical models, so a case study. And first of all, it's uh, lime alpha radiation. As I mentioned, it's very important because it's uh, it uh, couples the signal to the gas kinetic temperature uh, and allows actually to see the 21 centimeter against the background radiation. So the very first instances uh, there are, or very f uh, at the beginning, there are no other uh, sources because it takes much longer for X-ray binaries to form out of uh, the stellar population, and also ionization is much less efficient than uh, lime alpha effects. So at the beginning of cosmic dawn, we, we will purely see the effect of this lime alpha coupling, and uh, we will see if we see if we do imaging with SK, we will see a structure of coupled bubbles uh, in the 21 centimeter maps. So of course, this can directly tell us the distribution of the first sources uh, and the effective horizon of the slime alpha coupled bubbles if, uh, is few tens of megaparsecs. So if sources are rare and separated by larger distances, we will see how they cluster. And this will tell us, uh, in addition to clustering information, it can tell us uh, about the, first of all, timing of this uh, star formation, feedback processes that affected the star formation. For example, if we see this uh, velocity effect that I mentioned, then we can uh, relate that to the uh, halo mass in which stars formed and measure this, the efficiency of this feedback. 
Uh, and again, this happens in very small halos of so about 10 to the 5, 10 to the 7 solar mass halos and would give us a completely different information from the more evolved populations that we observe today. And if these galaxies also have radio emission, then uh, uh, they, that will contribute to the background radiation actually, and we will see deeper uh, line alpha coupled bubbles uh, than in the absence of this radio. Uh, like on this left left hand side picture, we see just line alpha coupled bubbles, and on the right hand side we see them with uh, this radio sources in. So it creates a deeper contrast, and uh, there is a radial profile uh, that is driven by the uh, radio emission from galaxies, uh, and just makes things more interesting. Uh, one of the other interesting effects that we can uh, constrain using 21 centimeters is what actually first black holes looked like and uh, how X-ray binaries formed. So there are several uh, mechanisms to heat up the gas. And uh, uh, for example, quasars, the first quasars could be very could be efficient in heating up the gas or uh, black hole binaries uh, from stars. So just byproducts of star formation, or even people consider uh, black, uh, dark matter annihilation or super strings or uh, sorry, cosmic strings or um, other uh, exotic phenomena. So by measuring the spectral energy distribution uh, of the sources from 21 centimeter signal, we can constrain their properties and number densities. Can I ask very quickly, so in the previous sure. slide you showed this increased uh, radio fluctuations mm -hmm. when you include the signal from galaxies, but is this including also the signal that could come from the, the mini quasars? Mm -hmm. Uh, at high redshift, so the so, things are coming from those. Thanks okay. for the question. So here we just assumed radio scales as star formation rate. Okay. So uh, if there are qu mini quasars, uh, they would have a different dependence on halo mass. And uh, we looked into mini quasars, but related without radio, okay. uh, just uh, taking into account their X-rays and uh, UV properties. Thanks. So they they do create a different signature. Okay. Uh, but uh, probably there would be very few mini quasars at stretch of 20, right? Because it takes a uh, longer time to build them up. So I would expect them to, it's an interesting question to check, of course. Uh, okay. Yeah. But uh, my first guess is that they will become important at a bit later times than uh, just uh, radio from smaller black holes, from stellar black holes. Yeah, I mean, it will depend on the formation model. If it's pop three stars or direct collapse, you would have a yeah, different, yeah. quite significant. I mean, it would be helpful to constrain, actually. The, yes, yeah. The, Thank you. Yeah, that's a good idea. Right. So uh, about X-rays. So just a, a few simple pictures that I drew in PowerPoint. These are not simulations, but uh, to show you how different spectral energy distribution can, what's the difference of spectral energy distribution on 21 centimeter signal or the effect of different distribution. So let's consider two types. First are uh, hard sources, meaning that they their energy peaks at a higher, uh, and so the mean energy emitted by the sources is higher around say one or two kV. And we will compare it to softer sources where energy peaks at uh, softer energies of uh, let's say 0.5 kV. So the main uh, difference between this is the mean free path uh, of uh, photons and where they inject energy into the gas. For soft sources in neutral gas, uh, it's about, um, I have numbers here. So for example, 0.5 kV have a mean free path of 10 megaparsecs uh, as opposed to 740 megaparsecs for 2 kV photons. So it means that uh, if you have 2 kV, uh, if you have a source which peaks at 2 kV, uh, the energy will be carried away to much larger cosmological distances and the heating overall will be less efficient because also uh, the universe expands during that time quite significantly. 
So this heated bubbles, even though the sources of the same uh, intensity as the softer one, they will be smoother. Uh, uh, flu this heating fluctuations will be on of lesser amplitude and uh, weaker overall. While in the case of soft sources, we will see much stronger fluctuations on smaller scales. So this is uh, reflected in 21 centimeter signal uh, directly. So I'll, uh, I will compare this two specific ex examples of spectral energy distributions. One is uh, power law uh, that peaks at 0.2 actually. And another is this uh, hard SED, which is actually a population synthesis of X-ray binaries. So it's something uh, realistic that we expect to see if you have just a uh, low metallicity X-ray binary population from high redshifts. So this is an example of how gas temperature would look like in a simulation. So on top, you see the uh, hard sources, so very mild fluctuations on large uh, scales. And on the bottom, you see the soft sources, which, are, which have stronger fluctuations, but on much smaller scales. And then this is a corresponding 21 centimeter maps. So again, uh, both types of sources have the same output energy, but the injected energy is very different. And so fluctuations in 21 centimeter signal at the fixed redshift look completely differently. So when we analyze power spectra and plot it uh, as a function of uh, on the y axis is uh, co moving angular scale, so wave number, so it's one over scale, and on the x axis is uh, redshift or frequency. Again, on the left hand side, you see hard spectrum, on the right hand side, you see soft spectrum. So we have a different uh, features. Uh, in particular, we see this uh, band here of low power in soft source that is not present in the hard sources. And this is because uh, lime alpha fluctuations actually anti correlate with X rays. Uh, in the case of soft sources, while in the case of hard sources, there is no such effect. So uh, by that, by this, uh, we can directly say if sources were just hard or, or soft at that time. And this is just to show you a slice at a fixed K, so fixed angular scale, and how it evolves with redshift. So in the case of soft sources, we see this a uh, very well-defined peak from X-rays, which is smeared in the case of hard sources. So to show you some constraints on data, as I said, it's uh, still very weak, but uh, nevertheless, I think it's exciting. So these are two simple antennas. So one is edges high band, uh, which is uh, a tabletop kind of uh, antenna. Uh, and the spherical one is called SARS-2. Uh, and they both are state of the art. Well, now they have next generation. Both teams are, have already produced next generation antennas, but at that time they were, uh, even though they might look to a naive person, sim very simplistic, but they actually very well calibrated and uh, thought through. Uh, and so on the right, on the left hand side, we see an ensemble of models that uh, I created and uh, the colored models are rejected by this data. So they're above the noise that the signal that the antennas measured and they didn't see any signals in their bands. So what we can uh, uh, rule out with this antennas is the basically adiabatically cooled universe without any X resources and, and also reionization that would peak in the antenna band. So I already showed these constraints, but uh, here maybe now you can see them with, a, to, with slightly more information from what I said earlier. So we can, uh, uh, the most, the strongest constraint here is on this X-ray heating uh, parameter, X-ray efficiency. So all these models with uh, low values of X-ray efficiency would contribute very deep contrast between uh, the CMP and gas temperature, and they are less favored by that by the data. Also, there is some indication that we do need uh, small halos. So if you if you only had very big massive halos, then the signals uh, would peak at very late times because these halos form at late times. Uh, and uh, 
in this case, everything would happen very quickly, but at late times, creating strong signals in the edges high band. And so such scenarios are disfavored. So we do need presence of small halos and we do need some amount of heating to be consistent with the data. But of course, uh, again, these constraints are very weak. There are also some constraints already coming from uh, power spectra experiments, such as LOFAR, and uh, also uh, HERA has taken data and uh, uh, is working on some uh, upper limits. Uh, so these constraints are again very weak, and uh, they can, uh, there are, for example, uh, these are LOFAR constraints on the models that they showed. Mm -hmm. So again, we can only have. Uh, at most 68% and rule out cold scenarios. Uh, but if you boost signals, for example, with respect to edges uh, detection, so adding either radio background in addition to the CMB and uh, boosting the signal by increasing the contrast or cooling down gas due to uh, dark matter, these signals can already be constraints better with LOFR because they add power. So of course there are more experiments uh, to come uh, and this field is evolving really quickly even though it takes longer than expected for uh, all the experiments there are many challenges that people discover every day such as uh, power leakage from one antenna into another and uh, contamination of polarized signal into unpolarized components and um, the effects, of course, of ionosphere and uh, all the radio backgrounds that exist between the uh, high redshifts and today, such as contributed by, gal by our galaxy. Uh, but these uh, issues are solved as they appear. Uh, and uh, there are more telescopes to come. For example, square kilometer array will uh, eventually be able to image uh, high redshift, the high redshift universe. HERA is a dedicated telescope to observe cosmic dawn and ionization, and it's a highly redundant array which will uh, measure power on uh, specif specified uh, scales. And then there are even several proposals and uh, several teams already developing satellites to observe uh, signals from behind the moon, uh, where we cannot, where we don't have radio frequency interference from the ground. Uh, and uh, this dark ages, uh, this uh, lunar arrays and uh, uh, missions can allow us to observe actually dark ages, so constrain uh, cosmology and dark matter, uh, which are Im impossible to do, which is impossible to do from the ground because uh, our ionosphere blocks this uh, large frequency, uh, large wavelengths to which the signals from dark ages are redshifted. So this is a very uh, exciting uh, time. So do I have several more minutes? Yeah, I would say uh, you certainly have five minutes. Okay, then I will briefly talk about dark matter. So what I showed before is uh, when we assume uh, lambda CDM cosmology with cold dark matter, but of course dark matter can be can have different properties. Uh, and even if uh, even if today we might not see that, uh, it might be manifested differently at high redshifts. Uh, I don't have so nice plots to show about uh, dark matter, but uh, I have many projects going on on that. And I just want to give you the idea of how it would affect the signal. So first of all, stars are born inside dark matter halos. And um, if we don't have small dark matter halos, for example, if dark matter was warm, or if uh, it was uh, ultralight axions that would just uh, smear structure on small scales, uh, we will not see signals from high redshifts uh, in absorption due to stars, just because star formation is delayed uh, owing to dark matter properties. Uh, another effect is that just uh, gas follows dark matter everywhere and uh, I mean in the intergalactic medium and uh, if dark matter has different distribution from cold in the uh, intergalactic medium then uh, 
or in regions between star, fo star forming regions, then we can see that also in 21 centimeter fluctuations from dark ages. And so I mentioned this effect and that's uh, uh, just that dark matter moves compared to gas, there are relative velocities that affect star formation in a specially non-uniform way. And we can see that in the power spectra of 21 centimeter signals, for example, this red line uh, is the best case scenario when there are small dark matter halos and the, they form stars very efficiently. And we see this uh, strong baryon acoustic oscillations here, uh, enhanced by the velocity patterns. While in the worst case scenario, this black line uh, we don't see such effect. Well, we see BAO still contributed by density fluctuations, but they are on much of much smaller amplitudes. Uh, another effect of dark matter that can be constrained is if dark matter interacts with gas. And there are several. There are so the edges detection, for example, boosted this area of research significantly because that's one of the effects that can explain this deep edges uh, absorption trough. <clears throat> so it turns out that uh, the vanilla model, if you just have 100% of dark matter interacting through uh, electromagnetic interactions with gas is ruled out by, of course, CMB and supernovae and uh, even LHC uh, data. But there is a space still to accommodate models um, uh, which in which dark matter is merely charged, so 10 to the minus 6 of electron charge, uh, and only a small fraction of it is actually interacting, so 10 to the 4 fraction of dark matter particles or by mass uh, can interact with gas. So there are uh, particle physics models that can uh, explain the, or can, can be accommodated within this window, and that of course would be very interesting from fundamental point of view to constrain the scenarios. Uh, another uh, effects, so I mentioned warm dark matter and uh, axion dark matter, but they actually, so I did some simulations with Philip Moss to study the structure uh, in these different cosmologies at cosmic dawn, because uh, again, halos have different sizes at cosmic dawn than today. Uh, and one interesting thing is that uh, actually in warm dark matter and axion cosmologies, because uh, there are no small scale structure, they are washed out by this uh, dark matter properties. Actually filaments become very dense, they don't fragment. Uh, and then they can accumulate gas and form stars throughout the entire filament. So uh, on this middle panel in uh, blue and uh, in purple and yellow, you see dark matter distributions in the three cosmologies. And then uh, green and blue are gas profile, uh, gas distribution and uh, black and yellow are stars. So the top one is the CDM and as expected, we see the fragmentation to sub halos. But in warm dark matter in this middle panel and axion dark matter in the bottom panel, stars are everywhere uh, inside the filament. And this is a simulation that we did with Arepo uh, code that is uh, hydrodynamically one of the most advanced codes in, in the world. Uh, and what we did is just to replace this dark matter part of it by uh, warm dark matter where there is just no small scale structure and axion dark matter where we solve schrodinger poisson equation uh, in Fourier space. So uh, in addition, in axion dark matter, you see because these are uh, these are kind of bosons, ultralight bosons. They create uh, fluctuations. They create basically interference pattern on huge com cosmological scales. And uh, here you see a bar of 0.5 megaparsecs for comparison. Because gas has uh, pressure, uh, it doesn't follow these ripples, uh, but maybe they can be observed through, I don't know what, gravitational lensing. We, we haven't thought that through, through yet carefully, but I think that's just, uh, that's a fun <laughs> property. Uh, this is a close up, so you can see a bit better this uh, interference patterns. Uh, and also, if you look, 
uh, if you measure profile of dark matter across the filament, for example, which uh, we cannot do in dark matter and CDM because it fragments, but we can for warm dark matter and fuzzy dark matter, uh, we find different properties and especially inside this filament. So fuzzy, uh, the Saxon dark matter would uh, have a core. So it, uh, the profile flattens because of this uh, bosonic properties, they don't cluster uh, beyond the, the broadly on the co coherent scale. Uh, while warm dark matter develops a, a sharper cusp towards the center of the filament. And you can see uh, here in the insert where we took measure this density profile. In addition, in, in the Saxon dark matter, they develop soliton, solitonic cores, uh, even inside filaments, not just in halos, as pe some people found before us, but we first saw them in filaments. So there are solitons uh, that uh, are that have this uh, cylindrical symmetry. Uh, and eventually we calculated the distribution of stars with JWST filters. As you can see here, CDM compared uh, to the warm dark matter and the axion case. And again, we see stars all around the filament here, uh, just like a very bright uh, string of stars. Uh, as time progresses, they will actually uh, collapse into spherical halos, uh, the, this uh, bigger, uh, so the uh, ends of this filament do have ma more massive halos and eventually they will attract all the stars uh, and gas and uh, fragment due to gravitational interaction by today. So it's not surprising that we don't see them today, but it could well very, very well be that at the redshift of 15, these galaxies uh, are sp spaghettified. <laughs> So uh, this example that we studied here is to dim for JWST to see because uh, of the low surface brightness, uh, but uh, our simulation was of a very small size. So it's, uh, I think, 1.5 uh, Comovin megaparsecs. Uh, and we, we weren't searching for uh, really bright objects to observe. We were just uh, studying the properties of these uh, objects. So it could be that there are brighter uh, galaxies that JWST can see actually. Uh, and I would like to stop here. So I, uh, I showed you that 21 centimeters is a really rich signal in terms of information and it can constrain properties of dark matter and uh, first stars and first black holes. Uh, and that's a very young but uh, exciting field. And we already started having observations that are good enough to rule out interesting scenarios. Thank you very much for attention. Great, thank you very much, uh, Anastasia, for this talk. Uh, so now questions, please raise your hands and we already have all help, please go ahead. Yeah, hi, very nice talk, thanks. Thank I've you. actually a few questions, but maybe some of them we can later when when people are yeah, sure lunch um i've just one a, a bit um um I'm, I'm a bit skeptical maybe for no reason but i'm a bit skeptical about the last results that you showed in terms of warm dark matter um okay. let's let me explain maybe you have an answer for that maybe you've looked into that but mm -hmm. So if you have these filaments, this is in the simplified, you know, Seldovich pancake like, like um, picture, it's, it's formally, um, you know, an inf infinite density, but it's not a potential that is um, actually has a minimum. So my, so I, I'm not so sure whether this could not be just an artifact of your hydro simulations, because hydro simulations, they, I mean, obviously do not do star formation from first principles, but they have generally these, you know, these limits when the density goes up above a threshold, you, you immediately form stars. So in warm dark matter, you're gonna, because there is no frag, you know, fragmentation in the, in the filament, you're gonna have pretty high densities. 
And I would not be surprised that the hydro simulation then shows this, you know, this, this stellar um, star formation. But I'm a bit skeptical whether this should happen in nature. Do, do you have thought about that or looked into that? Well, no, our Axion case for sure has a core, so it, it doesn't explode, right? It's flat, it has flat profile uh, all the way. Uh, and uh, we do see the same picture as here. And we also check that uh, they are consistent in terms of the smoothing scale because we matched this uh, warm dark matter simulation to axons. And also other people, so for warm dark matter, uh, we are not the first one to see this. So we, we first want to do this for axons, but uh, in warm dark matter, other people use different techniques and uh, different hydro simulations, not just a repo and uh, they saw the same. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of that. I'm, I'm aware of that. I think it's a paper by um, by the Durham group Gao and, a few years ago, but still, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I'm not, I, I'm a bit, I'm a bit confused maybe. Well, to me, it's, con I, I agree with you, <laughs> numerical simulations give you whatever you ask them to do, so, uh, but for me, it's um, comforting to see that we have similar result in uh, axion dark matter, even though the dark matter prescription is completely different. It's a solver in Fourier space, and uh, it's just a completely different implementation, right? But the physical result is, is That's similar. right, but the feedback is still implemented by, I guess, a density threshold, right? Right, but then uh, again, in uh, axion dark matter, uh, it flattens the density threshold, right? And it doesn't go infinitely. And also the radius, uh, of stars, if you see here, so we have star stellar profile uh, that is uh, so radially it's uh, well below, be, uh, it's much uh, so radial extent is much bigger than the resolution of dark matter simulation, and it follows dark matter profile on this uh, scale. So this stars and uh, this is a dark matter profile. So I understand okay. your concerns, but uh, to me it was con convincing to see this. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I'll let the others ask some questions. Then. Okay, uh, thank you all. So then we have Kai. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, hi Kai. Yeah, hello. Well, uh, nice talk. Um, I, I uh, had one question about this, um, this dip in the 21 centimeter single from, from edges that you uh, fitted with your simulations. So you mentioned that um, uh, one possibility would be to, to include this interacting dark matter um, mm -hmm. model. So what, what if you just vary the other uh, the, the parameters of the standard cosmological models? Would you get better fits than just you know assuming Planck or? Uh, yeah, so thanks for the question. We didn't, we, we did do fitting, but we didn't publish it because, uh, so I just signal has a very unique profile, at least their best fit. It's flatter, it's, it's very flat, which is hard to explain if you uh, look at my scenarios. Mm -hmm. uh, here, they are much more gradual, right? They're kind of Gaussian. And uh, in order to explain that flatness, uh, you need to, invoke some extra mechanism, for example, a low amount of extra heating at early stages. So actually, because we were not sure if edges is true or not, and they were themselves uh, uh, building another instrument or two to confirm it, uh, we didn't spend so much time to you know, fine tune and fiddle with these models. But uh, yes, if you tune, uh, so what I did was just to roughly try to see if signals fit. So even we, we didn't try to fit the shape and measure uh, goodness of fits, but we tried to see if there are signals that are narrow enough and deep enough without mm -hmm. worrying about details. And then you can, I should have somewhere uh, in one of the backup slides, uh, parameter space of models that would fit. Here, for example, this is a like, 
just fitting the shape and the depth in the case of this extra radio background models, you do find a lot of uh, models that are consistent. So blue dots are all models that are checked and the black ones are the those that are consistent with both edges high and low. Uh, and you see that there are sections of parameter space, for example, star formation efficiency should be high enough. Uh, we do need small halos, so the VC parameters should be low. We cannot just have very massive halos. Uh, and in this case, X-ray heating can be any, basically. We can match it with the radio amplitude. OK. And uh, can you say some sentences? Sorry, it was quite long, I'm sorry. Maybe a few words about the other experiments that are prepared to, to confirm the edges results? Well, we still, uh, there are several, for example, uh, Sarah's team, the one that, uh, is, uh, yeah, I, this is probably the best slide to show. Do you see it? Sorry if it's not full screen, but uh, okay. uh, there are um, this experiment, conical antenna is called Sarah's three, and they are taking data and um, hopefully will update us soon. I don't know the status of it. Uh, then LOFAR actually has a program uh, LOFAR absorbs power spectrum, and they have uh, a proposal running, and they already published some upper limits from Redshift 2018 uh, to measure power spectrum. And actually, if you expect deeper absorption in global signal, you also expect uh, stronger signals in power spectrum. So actually, LOFAR can be is sensitive enough to reject some of these models at Redshift 18 with their new proposal. Mm. So they are doing that and uh, uh, they published some limits which are still weak, but uh, they, they, these were based on just uh, maybe four hours. Well, they, the proposal is for thousand hours, so uh, they might see something. Uh, also Edges has several other antennas that they are now working on, uh, Edges 3, uh, including mid-band antenna, which uh, so I spoke about high band, which uh, observes ionization, and low band, which observes cosmic dawn. They are disconnected in terms of frequency range, but they constructed mid band, which overlaps uh, between these two uh, high band and low band antennas. And they are, uh, as far as I know, also were taking data with that. So it just takes a lot of time to refine data analysis and antennas, and uh, uh, but they're working on that. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Great, and then we have uh, Lucio, please. Yeah, uh, so first of all, thanks a lot. It was a great talk, very interesting. Thank you. Um, I have a, a kind of general question. So you stress the importance of the lightweight simulations to serve a parameter space. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other end, some of the, the interesting process that you showed, which, which have interesting effects, such as on the fluctuations in the 21 centimeter signal in the, in the cosmic down phase, they depend a lot on what happens at, at the small scale in a way, right? Because they depend a lot on, for example, you know, whether mini quasars are doing something or not, or how star formation is happening in the mini halos. So isn't there a kind of a mismatch between, you know, the, the philosophy of the lightweight simulation and this important small scale processes? Well, it's... Effects? Thanks. It's a, I would say it's a challenge. It's not a mismatch. So the way we do it is to uh inform yourself to the best possible level based on uh, small hy hydrodynamical simulations so people are it's a whole industry to study black holes and star formation people do one megaparsec simulations to explore primordial star formation so we calibrate uh, come up with a subgrid model that uh, cali is calibrated to the state of the art hy hydrodynamical simulations uh, and then uh, build to our best abilities a match between say, so I have three megaparsec resolution pixel and I can say there are 10 halos and I know what masses are, these halos are based on the um, halo abundance, uh, yeah. the yeah. Shastorman or something else. And then uh, I can go back to this hydro simulations, the best that we have and uh, Based on them, tell how many stars each uh, this, of these halos have. 
and then statistically from which, from each pixel I will have uh, corresponding emissivities in the stars. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess what what I wonder is if I mean if we are after fluctuations, right? It's always a problem. I mean, in general, when you have fluctuations in a in, in a general physical problem, it's, it's always a an issue of the scale, right? You 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 never know how much you lose by integrating over a certain larger scale, right? In, in, in the signal information. So, so I, I guess I can turn around the question and ask, which is also something I'm directly interested in. What, what, what do you think is the smallest volume of the simulation that you can consider by trading off with some more accuracy in resolution, you know, for your application? You know, suppose you can go to higher resolution, but of course you have to reduce the size of the volume of the simulation. What size would be still large enough for you to be happy with the application that you have in mind? I guess you need to have 100 megaparsecs to match uh, the SK volumes, at least. 100 megaparsecs, OK. Yeah. And then, of course, there are high resolution simulations of ionization they, that, well, they also have to implement subgrid models to some extent, but they resolve they don't do properly stuff formation anyway, but okay. um, yeah. they are very heavy and they run months on supercomputers, right? And so you, you cannot use them to do parameter fitting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, but uh, in our simulations, we did actually implement uh, regimes where you have only one star per pixel and then you have fluctu Poisson fluctuations in number of sources and number of stars. And we actually, also took into account uh, variables, uh, random star formation efficiency in this object. So you can do that uh, still in, even in the simple simulations. And then uh, once there are more halos, they basically average out, right? So yeah. if you have three megaparsec volume as a resolution element, you'll have, I don't know how many, 10 halos, 100 halos eventually there. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, so you can then build the statistical model. Statistically, it makes sense. Yeah, I agree. Thanks. Sorry, I'm taking time. No, and uh, actually, so I was showing that our initial conditions are density and velocity fields. So every pixel actually has different condition, environmental conditions for density and velocity. And we are implementing also metallicity. So star formation in every pixel sl slightly differs from in ev everywhere else. Uh, yeah. And it actually helps with fluctuations. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Super. So I know that Aurel has more questions, as you said, but um, I suggest that since we've already reached uh, noon, that we uh, we stop the, the official seminar here. And then anyways, the, the Zoom uh, session is still on for half an hour at least. So. For those who are interested in more questions, maybe we can continue this way. Is that okay? Yes. Thank you very much for your attention. So let's yes. thank our speaker again.